One of the most asked questions I get in my comment section is how I conclude whether a stock is cheap or expensive. And to be honest, valuing stocks is more of an art than a science. How I value a stock versus how someone else values a stock may be totally different, but both ways may still be valid. However, my understanding of stock valuations comes directly from Warren Buffett, and I do my best to replicate his thinking because he keeps it very simple and very logical. So in today's video, I want to share with you all a clip of Warren Buffett explaining how to value a stock, and really any investment in general. This is going to be a video that I hope will demystify the art of valuations. So let's get into what Warren Buffett has to say. Hello, Mr. Buffett. I got two short questions. One is how do you find intrinsic value in a company? Well, intrinsic value is what is the number that if you were all knowing about the future and could predict all the cash that a, bu a business would give you between now and Judgment Day, discounted at the proper discount rate, that number is what the intrinsic value of business is. In other words, the only reason for making investment and laying out money now is to get more money later on, right? That's, that's what investing is all about. Now, when you look at a stock, when you look at a bond, so it means the United States government bond, it's very easy to tell how much you're going to get back. It says it right on the bond. It says when you get the interest payments, it says when you get the principal. So it's very easy to figure out the value of a bond. It can change tomorrow if interest rates change. But you are, the cash flows are printed on the bond. The cash flows aren't printed on a stock certificate. That's the job of the analyst, is to print out, change that stock certificate, which represents an interest in the business, and change that into a bond and say, this is what I think it's going to pay out in the future. When we buy you know, some new machine for Shaw to make carpet, that's what we're thinking about, obviously. And you, you all learn that in business school. But it's the same thing for a big business. It, it, if you buy Coca-Cola today, the company is selling for about 100 and 10 to 15 billion dollars in the market. The question is, if you had 110 or 15 billion, you wouldn't be listening to me, but uh, I'd be listening to you incidentally. Uh, but the question is, would you lay it out today to get what the Coca-Cola company is going to deliver to you over the next two or 300 years? The discount rate doesn't make much difference after, uh, as you get further out. But, and that is a question of how much cash they're going to give you. It isn't a question of, you know, it isn't a question about how many analysts are going to recommend it or what the volume in the stock is or what the chart looks like or anything. It's a question of how much cash it's going to give you. That's the only reason. It's the true if you're buying a farm. It's true if you're buying an apartment house. Any financial asset, oil in the ground, you're laying out cash now to get more cash back later on. And the question is, is how much are you going to get, when are you going to get it, and how sure are you? And when I calculate intrinsic value of a business, when we buy businesses, and whether we're buying all of a business or a little piece of a business, I always think we're buying the whole business because that's my approach to it. I look at it and say, what, what will come out of this business and when? And what you really like, of course, is them to be able to use the money they earn and earn higher returns on it as you go along. I mean, Berkshire has never distributed anything to its shareholders, but its ability to distribute goes up as the value of the businesses we own increases. We can compound it internally. But the real question is, Berkshire selling for, we'll say, 105 or so billion now. Uh, what can we distribute from that 100? If you're going to buy the whole company for 105 billion now, can we distribute enough cash to you soon enough to make it sensible at present interest rates to lay out that cash now? And that's, that's what it gets down to. And if, the, if you can't answer that question, you can't buy the stock. You know, you can, you can gamble in the stock if you want to, or your neighbors can buy it. But if you don't answer that question, and I, I can't answer that for, for internet companies, for example. There are a lot of companies, there are all kinds of companies I can't answer it for, but I just stay away from those. All right, so the first clip had a ton of golden nuggets, so let's just break them down. Warren starts by saying the value of any investment is how much cash that investment can generate you from now until Judgment Day, versus the risk-free rate, which is a government bond. Bonds have their return rate printed right on them. For example, the 10-year bond has a return rate of 1.6% today. So if you buy this bond today, then you're getting a 1.6% annual return. That's it, and there's nothing else to it. However, when we're looking at stocks, businesses, or any other kind of investment, it's our job as the investor to figure out how much cash the investment will generate for us. This makes it much more difficult because the return isn't just printed out for us like it is on a bond. 
He then gives us the example of Coca-Cola at a $110 billion valuation and asks us if we had $110 billion, would we spend it all on buying Coke based on how much cash the business can return to us? Now, this video of Warren Buffett was recorded back in 2001, so let's go and take a look at Coke's fundamentals back then. Here in 2001, we can see that Coke was producing $3.3 billion in free cash flow, and Warren again said the company had a valuation at the time of $110 billion. So if we divide the free cash flow by the valuation to find a percentage, it tells us that the business had the ability to return about 3% back to shareholders at that $110 billion valuation. Or in other words, if we bought Coke outright with $110 billion, the business could return $3.3 billion to us annually, which again is about a 3% annual return on our investment. Now on July 18th, 2001, which was the date which Warren was recorded in this video, the 10-year bond was yielding 5.14%, which is higher than the 3% Coke was yielding at that $110 billion valuation. What this means is that on July 18th, 2001, a 10-year bond was yielding a higher return than Coke could deliver at its current valuation. So if we had that $110 billion, we could have actually gotten a higher return by simply buying a 10-year bond, rather than buying out Coca-Cola. Coke was simply just too expensive when we compare it versus the bond yields. Warren really likes looking at stocks as if he is going to be buying the whole business like this, because it helps him put these comparisons in more perspective. And when we're buying a stock, we're really buying the business at its current valuation. So we should also be paying attention to the valuations we're paying versus the cash the underlying business can generate when we are buying stocks, just like how Warren Buffett does. He then goes on to say it doesn't matter how many analysts are recommending the stock, what the volume of the stock has on the day, what the stock's chart looks like, all that matters when valuing a business is how much cash that business can generate you versus the price we're paying today. And then also comparing that return against the risk-free rate of a government bond. Warren then gives us another example about Berkshire Hathaway, and once again asks the audience, could Berkshire distribute enough cash to you at a $105 billion valuation to make it a sensible investment at present interest rates? So let's now go and take a look at what Berkshire Hathaway was producing back in 2001 instead of Coke. Here we can see that back in 2001, Berkshire was generating about $5.4 billion in annual free cash flow. And again, Warren said the company was valued at about $105 billion at this time. So if we divide Berkshire's $5.4 billion in free cash flow by the $105 billion valuation, interestingly enough, we get a 5.14% yield which is exactly what the 10-year bond yield was producing on the date that Warren was recorded. So back in 2001, at a $105 billion valuation, Berkshire could return as much cash to investors as a 10-year bond, basically exactly as much cash. So the question then becomes, why would any investor want to buy Berkshire over a 10-year bond that produces the same amount of cash, but holds essentially no risk? Well, the answer is because over time, Berkshire has the ability to grow its cash flows, whereas buying a 10-year bond means you're locking in that 5.14% return for the next 10 years. What this means is that if Berkshire's cash flows go up, or in other words, the amount of cash it can produce goes up, then it's a more attractive investment than a 5.14% bond. Let me show you an example here. In 2002, Berkshire's free cash flow grew all the way up to $11.6 billion, which means the amount of cash the business could generate on the 2001 valuation was now sitting at 11%. Remember, if we purchased Berkshire back in 2001 at the $105 billion valuation, then that is the price that we paid. And when we own it in 2002, our purchase price hasn't suddenly changed. However, the amount of cash that the business can produce has actually grown. So the amount of cash the business can generate in 2002 versus the price we paid in 2001 is now sitting at 11%, which really beats the bond yield of 5.14%. And if we take a look at Berkshire's free cash flow today, it's grown to $29.4 billion, meaning the amount of cash Berkshire can generate us now versus our initial purchase price of $105 billion back in 2001 generates a 28% annual return, which seriously beats that 5.14% bond yield. So the reason that investors are willing to buy certain stocks over bonds when bond yields are on par or even greater is because the investor is anticipating that the amount of cash the business can generate in the future is going to grow, just like Berkshire did. Now, our job as the investor is to make sure that we are right on the businesses that we buy and in our analysis of their future cash flow potential. And honestly, this is one of the hardest parts. 
Warren says he can't accurately predict every business's future cash flow, and the ones he is unsure about, he simply just avoids. If he doesn't believe he can estimate how much cash a business can generate in the future, then he simply won't buy its stock. And think about it, the only reason we take on an investment is to get more money later. And if we don't know how to tell how much money we are going to get later, then it's really hard to make the investment or know how the investment should be valued. We also need to make sure we're not overestimating how much money a business can generate in the future, and ultimately paying too much for the business's future cash flows that aren't yet realized. And just for an example, if a business is valued at $500 billion today, and it's only producing $1 billion in annual cash flows, then it's currently producing next to no returns when I buy it. This means I need to be sure that the company will be able to produce at least $25 billion in cash flow in the future or more to get even a 5% return on the valuation today. Now, growing the cash flows by 25x in a reasonable amount of time is a really hard thing for a company to do. So if the business is not generating much cash versus its current valuation, then I consider it to be an expensive and speculative stock because you're already paying for the company's future cash flows that may never become a reality. But now let's move on and listen to the second part of this clip, which is really just Warren Buffett talking more about interest rates when valuing stocks. And I'll explain what Warren is saying to the best of my ability afterwards, because interest rates and what he talks about is a little bit confusing. But when we break it down, it is it is quite easy to understand. So let me stop talking and let's just hop into the second clip. Number two. So you got formulas involved in finding intrinsic values on certain companies. I mean, you've got a mathematical system set up. Just got a present value of future cash, yeah. Okay. Second short question is, why haven't you um, written down your set of formulas or your strategies in written form so you can share it with everyone else? Well, I think I actually have written about that. Uh, if, if you read the annual reports over the recent years, in fact, the most recent annual report, I, I, I use what I've just been talking about. I use the illustration of Esau. Because here Aesop was in 600 BC. Smart man, wasn't smart enough to know it was 600 BC though. I mean, <laughs> would take a little foresight. Uh, but Aesop, you know, in between tortoises and hares and all these other things, he found time to write about, you know, birds. And he said, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now that isn't quite complete. Because the question is, how sure are you that there are two in the bush? And how long do you have to wait to get them out? Now, he probably knew that, but he just didn't have time because he had all these other proverbs to write uh, and had to get on with it. So, but he was halfway there in 600 BC. That's all there is to investing is how many birds are in the bush, when are you going to get them out, and how sure are you? Now, if interest rates are 15%, roughly, you've got to get two birds out of the bush in five years to equal the bird in the hand. But if interest rates are 3% and you can get two birds out in 20 years, it still makes sense to give up the bird in the hand because it all gets back to discounting against an interest, uh, an interest rate. The uh, problem is often you don't know, you know, not only how many birds are in the bush, but in the case of the internet companies, there weren't any birds in the bush. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but they still take the bird that you give them if they're in the hand. Uh, but it's, but I, I, I actually have written about this sort of thing. And, uh, stealing heavily from Aesop, who wrote it some 2,600 years ago, but I've been behind on my reading. <laughs> All right, so in the second clip, Warren talks a lot about this bird in the hand analogy. Now, the bird in the hand is your money you're looking to invest, and the two birds in the bush are basically you trading your one bird for two, or in other words, you doubling your money. So to put it simply, you give one bird and you get two, or you give your money and you get double back. Now Warren says this analogy isn't quite complete though, because you also need to figure out how long it's going to take to double your money. And think about it like this. If you invest $100 and it takes 100 years to double that money, then that's a pretty lousy investment. However, if it takes you only one year to double your money, then that's a pretty incredible investment. So we always need to think about how long it's going to take to double our money and factor in the time element to any one of our investments. The question then becomes, how much weight do we place on time? And how do we go about factoring time into an investment? Well, once again, we need to compare our investment returns against what interest rates are currently doing. Warren uses the example that if interest rates or bond yields were at 15%, then we would need to double our money in about five years to make the investment worth it. Now, why is this? Well, because if we can get a guaranteed 15% yield risk-free on a bond, then we could simply buy a government bond and double our money in about five years. 
So if interest rates were sitting at 15%, then again, any investment not doubling our money as fast as the risk-free 15% rate wouldn't make sense to take on. Now on the other hand, Warren says that if interest rates are only 3%, then any investment where we can double our money in 20 years now becomes attractive. This is because at an annual return of 3%, it takes about 24 years to double our money. So if the risk-free rate on a bond is 3%, then now any investment generating above 3% suddenly looks a lot more attractive when we compare it against the risk-free rate. So when we are factoring in time to our investments, we also need to take a look at the risk-free rate and always compare our investments to what it is currently doing. Warren has also said in the past that the risk-free rate is the yardstick against which we should make investment decisions. And this is because whenever an investor has money, they need to ask themselves where they are getting the best risk reward. And if the reward on a risk-free bond is sitting at 15%, then any asset producing less than 15% becomes much, much less attractive. So investors are always, always, always looking at what bond yields are producing when looking at stock valuations to make sure that the stocks they're buying are producing more cash than a bond would. So to quickly summarize what we have learned in this video, Warren says investors should ask themselves when valuing businesses, how much cash can this business produce and buy when, versus what bond yields are currently producing. This one sentence has changed the way that I value businesses and look at investments forever. It's just so simple and so logical and I haven't found anything else that makes this much sense and also makes me comfortable when I am investing in a stock. Now on top of this, investors should also always look at buying stocks as if we're buying the whole business. This will ensure that we're paying attention to the valuation of the business when we buy it and help make sure that we're not overpaying relative to the amount of cash that the business can generate for us. When we invest or when we buy a stock, we are buying something that produces cash, and we need to make sure that we aren't overpaying for that investment's cash flows. But that is going to wrap up the video, everyone. And if you enjoyed this video or you found it helpful in some way, then please remember to leave a like on it. And if you want to stick around and see more content like this and you're not yet subscribed to the channel, then please make sure you subscribe to the channel as well so you can stay up to date with all of my future videos. But again, that is going to wrap up the video, everyone. So thank you all again so much for watching, and I really hope to see you all in my next one.